Hey, and welcome back to another episode of the Two Photo Nuts. We have, once again, my hero, Macro Master, Don, back on. Notice I didn't pronounce his last name this time. <laughs> Don, how you doing? I'm doing great, Bob. How about yourself? All right, so I know you're from Barrie, Ontario, so what's the weather like out there? Oh, it is uh, sunny. It's a bit of a scorcher here. Uh, we're at about 30 degrees and uh, and bright and sunny with near 100% humidity. So I'm glad I'm inside in my office where it's nice and cool right now. <laughs> I would be too. <laughs> we don't have those things in Campbell River, so we're, we're kind of okay. But we have a special show today, which is going to be just awesome because we're going to talk about photo stacking. So... Hopefully everybody knows what photo stacking is, but we're going to go to Don and say, Don, explain photo stacking. What actually is it? Well, it's, uh, it's the technique where you can take multiple images, and each of them are at a different focus point. Um, and why you need to take them this way, well, we'll get into that. But you will then combine those images together to have the focus of those multiple points combined together. Uh, the technique is called photo stacking or focus stacking. Either way, uh, it's sort of interchangeably used. And um, again, we talked about in the macro show that we did before that one of the biggest challenges that macro photographers face is depth of field. You can never get enough of it. And the closer and closer you get, the shallower your depth of field is going to be. Uh, and there's no way around that in camera. If you try, everything will just get incredibly soft due to diffraction. So you have to just take those little slivers, those little slices of focus as they are. Uh, but if you can take every one of them along the way, then you can combine them together to get focus everywhere across. Now that's not always possible in, in every scenario. Uh, some subjects are too transient, uh, that are too, uh, like, it's there one second and gone the next, and it's never in the same place twice. You know, in the summertime, insects and stuff like that, it's very, very difficult to do any focus stacking work because things are constantly in motion. But if you have a static subject, or at least a relatively static subject, focus stacking can allow you to combine all of those separate images together uh, to create something really unique and really fun. Um, more than the camera would ever be able to capture in one image alone. Yeah, but okay. But you, for me anyways, you're actually known for snowflake photography. And you don't have a lot of time to work with. So you've got to be A, very fast, because the snowflake's going to melt very, very fast. And you're stacking these things. So yes. to me, that, that's incredible. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my, losing my voice. That's absolutely incredible because when I say focus stacking, I, I'm thinking 1, 10, 15 pictures. You're not doing 1, 10, or 15 pictures. You're doing how many? Well, on average, it's between 40 and 50 separate images that I combine together. The most I've done is about 70. Um, but because I'm shooting these handheld, uh, and I should, I should say, well, why the heck are you doing these handheld? Because that just seems like it's adding a lot more complexity to the whole scenario. You need to work fast. You just mentioned it before, Bob. The snowflakes are actively melting or sublimating, like sort of like they're evaporating uh, from a solid. And uh, so they're disappearing in front of your eyes. A minute goes by and the tips of the branches are gone. Right? So you have to get in, find exactly the right angle as quickly as possible, and shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, and I might shoot over a minute or two, and I might collect 200 images of the same snowflake. And then I have to go through and choose exactly which of those 200 I need. I've doubled up on some of them, but I have to in order to hedge my bets because I don't know if I've gotten every slice that I need if I only take 50 images. I might have taken two of the same slice and missed one. Uh, so I always overshoot. And then I go through and I find the images that all kind of match up to the different pieces of the puzzle. And, uh, and then I go through and, and kind of complete that process. And I can show you how that process goes. Uh, and uh, so if I, if I were to, uh, to do a screen share with you here, Bob, um, if I show you this is going to be my, my Lightroom screen. So this is a, a raw snowflake image right out of camera. Uh, and you'll notice two things about this first and foremost. Uh, Bob, can you pick up on what those two things are? Uh, I'm thinking like the autofocus or the color that's in it? Uh, well, n number one, uh, yeah, I've got a tiny sliver of focus running through it. And so, yep. you know, the backside and the front side, they're out of focus in this particular snowflake. But also, it's very dark. 
Yes. Um, I, I intentionally underexpose these things because there are some really bright highlight areas that I definitely do not want to have overexposed. But I also need to have less flash power because I'm firing off 200 flashes of the snowflake in a minute. Uh, the flash needs to keep up with that. And I don't want the light uh, from the flash to produce heat and melt my subject. So the flash is typically a little bit underpowered and that darkens the image a bit. But it's very easy for me to say, uh, you know, take the uh, the whites slider in Lightroom or something like that, and maybe adjust some of the uh, the color settings just to, to you know, very quickly uh, bring the image uh, up to what I want it to be. Uh, and yeah, I could play around with all of these settings, but I won't do that on on a live uh, performance here. What I would then do is I would take this image and all of the other component pieces alongside it. Uh, and I would send them into Photoshop. So what I would do is if I, um, if I just kind of get a feel for all of my images, because uh, I've got hundreds of these things that I have not edited yet. Uh, and so if I, if I let Lightroom kind of catch up to me here, this image is one of however many hundreds that I have. If I just choose another one from that same sequence, you'll see that the, uh, the the focus is ever so slightly different on this one than it was on the previous one. And if I were to choose another image uh, further down the sequence, you'll see that the focus is further towards the backside. Every one of these images is at a slightly different focus point, uh, and I would take as many of them as I would need, and I would select all of those once I had done the edits and everything, uh, and I would just choose Edit In, uh, and then at the bottom of my list here, Open uh, as Layers in Photoshop. And that process will bring up the image in Photoshop uh, as all of the separate layers. And I've kind of queued that up already. So I have, uh, well, there's a freezing soap bubble, uh, which, again, I wanted to show that because you can't focus stack these things. You can't focus stack a freezing soap bubble. But, yeah, but hang the concept on. Don, is... Don, Don, Don. Yes. Go back Bob. to that. Go back to that bubble. Uh, where were we here? That's the bubble. That is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's an absolutely amazing picture, um, and you know what? I, I love I, I this I was going to talk about this after the snowflakes. Okay, let's go uh, then. So may, may, maybe let, keep this as a teaser for now. <laughs> we will come back to it to show you this different technique. Um, but what happens is when I bring all of my images into Photoshop, uh, number one, I've got to align them. And this is kind of after the alignment process has been completed because I didn't want you to be watching a progress bar complete for a long period of time. But um, you can see the edges of the frame here are all uh, mismatched because Photoshop has gone in and realigned every image so that the snowflake within this frame is in exactly the same space on each and every one of these images. So it's under the edit menu. You just choose auto align layers and you're off. But so if I click through these layers, I can kind of see through each and every one of them. This is a very three dimensional snowflake here. So each of these images corresponds to a slightly different point of focus along the snowflake. Uh, and so I would then uh, make sure that all of these are properly aligned, uh, every image along the way. And if anything was out of alignment, I could nudge it around uh, to make sure that it's in alignment with its buddies. Uh, and then I would auto blend them. And so the auto blending process will take the areas of focus and combine them together automatically. It's not a perfect system. It fails more often than it succeeds, but it gives you a foundation. And that foundation is what you'll need in order to start applying your own fixes to the process. Um, so I've got another image that I had kind of gone through that same process with here, uh, another snowflake image that's more of a traditional kind of style image. And if I were to uh, you know, uh, click off some of these different layers, you'll see as the focus kind of falls through uh, different images have different layers of focus. They're not necessarily all in sequence, but they don't necessarily need to be. Uh, and as I would be combining those all together across the way, um, then Photoshop will give me, at the end of all of that, they will give me a, an image that has everything sharp everywhere in the photograph. So that's a starting point for me. That's, that's where I would say, okay, so Photoshop has done its magic. You'll notice that there's little fibers and these little um, black lines and stuff that are, are running through the image. That's because each and every one of my snowflakes are photographed on this homemade black mitten uh, that is quite bedraggled now that it's spent like five or six winters outside. Uh, and uh, the reason why, well, 
the black background, of course, is for contrast. But the little fibers in this mitten lift the snowflake away from most of the background. And while some of them get into the frame, uh, it's not difficult to edit those out because they're usually completely separate from that, the snowflake. Um, and because it's lifted away from the background by one or two separate fibers, it acts as an insulator so that the snowflake doesn't melt uh, in, uh, in the process of, um, of photographing it while I'm, while I'm actively working on that. So uh, when we're dealing with these kinds of, uh, of snowflake images, you'll notice that if I really zoom in on this, you'll see that little pieces of, this, um, of these um, fibers are kind of coming across this way. Certain parts of it, like up here, you've got this fiber that's covering up over the snowflake here. I've got to edit all of that out. Uh, I got to make it nice and pristine. Sometimes the automatic focus stacking process gives me like really blurry edges here that I can fix. They don't necessarily need to be that blurry. Um, or, uh, geez, I, if, I, if I dive into the details around the snowflake, I'm sure I could find a ton of uh, little tiny points of failure that I would go in and that I would manually fix. Uh, and that process, I would go through every one of the individual layers, creating a layer mask, and paint in the fixes with a brush uh, to make sure that everything is as perfect as it can be across this particular snowflake. Uh, and some of them are little, some of them I'll notice and nobody else will notice. But if I really zoom in on this, Bob, you can see uh, right here, these lines uh, here disconnect in the middle of the frame and then they reconnect ever so slightly off. They're two pixels off. But that's something that I would go in and I would fix. Uh, and will the average person know that this is a point of disconnect? No, absolutely not. But I would. And so I'm a perfectionist when it comes down to it. And I want to make sure that especially if I'm putting these into another project, if I'm making a, a print out of these kinds of things, then those details all the way down to the nitty gritty are you know what what is paramount to, to the success of these particular photographs i i love spending the time in those details uh, and those details as i finish these images they turn into something really fun so here's an example of one that's a finished product the background completely clean uh, and again the details if you dive in um, they're all completely cleaned up the colors are exactly where they should be the brightnesses have been tweaked to be as as perfect as they can be and, uh, and so that's kind of the, the final snowflake image that you end up with. Uh, some of them, like that first one that I had shown you, the very three-dimensional one, uh, something like that would end up like this when you finish the focus stacking process. And it looks like a, a pedestal of ice, really. Uh, could you imagine that this is a snowflake that measures a millimeter tall? It, it's, it's amazing what falls from the sky around you all the time. Uh, there's another one that's more of the classic design. So you've got, uh, you know, sometimes a geometric center that gives you all of these wonderful branches uh, or these crazy, almost like uh, trident style branches on this guy here. So for me, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm just in my glory with these finished products. Yes, it takes me four to five hours to get to this point. It's not something that happens immediately. And that's after I've uh, froze my butt off out in the field taking these snowflake images when it's, you know, minus 15 outside in order to, uh, to, to get the right uh, material to put it all together. So uh, is that something you feel like you want to tackle, Bob? Heck no, it's too much involved. <laughs> <laughs> Heck no, Don, I know you too well. <laughs> you know what, though, is these images, and everything, everything like these, like you know, some of them are more simple. The small hexagonal snowflakes require fewer images, and they carry their own mystery. Uh, and, uh, and they're beautiful as they are. This would have required maybe 15 to 20 images. You can focus stack a landscape as well. Uh, so let's say if you're doing a night sky shoot, you want to have one image focused on the stars, then you can pull back and have one image focused on the foreground, and you can combine those together uh, in the same process because typically when you're shooting at night, you've got a wide open aperture. And you'll have that same challenge of a shallow depth of field. It's applicable to many areas in photography. Uh, but when you get into that macro world with focus stacking, man, it reveals just a world of fun and mystery. Uh, like if we take a look at some of these things that have vibrant colors, could you have predicted that these colors exist inside of a snowflake? Probably not. Uh, but it's the same physics that puts colors inside of a soap bubble. Uh, so, you know, the, um, the, the rainbow patterns in a soap bubble caused by thin film interference, that's a lesson for another day. Uh, but there's little bubbles inside of the ice that create these vibrant, crazy colors. Uh, and there's so much fun to, uh, to play around with and to see, okay, well, th this, this natural world around us that falls by the trillions outside in the wintertime in my neck of the woods, anyhow, uh, 
has untold beauty. And when I have to dig out the snowblower and uh, and clear off like 10 feet of snow, uh, it's frustrating. But then you imagine that that the beauty that we see here in this image is replicated by the trillions that's fallen. And uh, I don't know, it makes winter a little bit more tolerable to say the least. Well, here's here's a couple of questions because now I'm I'm you've got me thinking again as always. How do you capture a single snowflake? So, um, well, if the the mitten gets too cluttered, I just shake it off and then I wait for fresh snow to fall on it. So that's the easiest way to do that. Um, if the snow is falling very ferociously and you know there's so much going down at once, um, I'll take a very small artist's paintbrush and I'll use that to just kind of clear some of the clutter away from what looks like a really good snowflake and sometimes just adjust the angle with it. Uh, half the time when I do that, I end up breaking the snowflake that I'm after into pieces because they are very fragile things. Um, but there's more snowflakes always falling, so that's not such a loss. Uh, just go on to the next one and keep on going. Keep on going. Um, so, so you have to be doing it when the snow is actively falling, because if you're photographing it even 10, 15 minutes later, it's now a shell of its former self. Um, its branches have degraded, and the center might be the same, but everything else on the outer edges of it uh, has become a lot more blobular uh, because everything gets rounded as things evaporate. And so you've got to be working fast as soon as they fall. And as they're falling, you know, that perfect snowflake just lands and you go in uh, and you try and get on the right angle for it. Yeah, okay. Now, we have to go through and discuss how dedicated you are to this. Because for the last four years, you have put together a snowflake a day during the winter. For, I think you call it 100 days of, of snowflakes. That's right. So um, it keeps me motivated to, uh, to, to be processing the images because I always photograph more than I would ever have time to edit. Uh, because if, I, if there's a great snowfall, I will shoot as many snowflakes as I can until the snow stops. Uh, and so I'm actively going out and, and doing that for every, uh, every snowfall. But, so that means I might take 40 images in a day. Uh, and then there might be a week or two that I don't have anything. So I edit one every day and post it online. So that becomes full-time work through the winter time for me. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's a crazy challenge. But it, built up a bot, uh, it has built up a body of work that has gained the attention of CBC. And uh, they featured me on an episode of The Nature of Things because of my work with snowflakes. Um, BBC One has just uh, uh, aired yesterday um, an episode of Forces of Nature, which prominently features some of my snowflake work in video form. And, uh, and I've produced a print that uh, actually, I should have, it's just in, in the other room, um, that has over 400 separate snowflakes um, I'll actually try to pull up a, a version of it here. It has over 400 separate snowflakes uh, in the same image that took over five years to produce and over 2,500 hours to produce. Uh, because of the time it takes for each individual snowflake, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very time-consuming process. So let me just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll share that here. I won't zoom in on it because I, I, I won't be loading up the, uh, the full version of it. But you'll be able to take a look on the screen and uh, just so, get an idea so, as to the time and effort put into this singular project um, for a five-year period. Yes. And so on average, what does it take you to do each snowflake? Not that you probably... The average is four to five hours. Uh, if for the small ones, I might get away with, say, two to three hours maybe. Uh, and the really complicated ones, I've, I've spent a whole day on one, like eight hours plus. Um, but, you know, the, the, the end result is always worth it, uh, and you can always dive into the details. The full version of this image is a 12 gigapixel file. Uh, and so I could print this, like, on the side of a building, and you could still nose up to it and see detail. And so that's it's kind of a, a fun little accomplishment. Uh, and where the series will take me next? Uh, well, who knows? I've been experimenting with uh, stereoscopic imagery, so I might be doing some 3D snowflakes uh, this coming winter, which is... <laughs> it, it, always more challenging as time goes on and it's always more fun um but uh, i know we're kind of uh, reaching the end of our time again bob but i want to go back to the image that you were uh you know uh swooning over earlier because this is a fun thing to do that even if you don't have good snow you can make stuff just like this uh where you are uh bob how how cold does it get on the coldest winter days uh, I'm going to say we'll head under zero. We'll, we'll be able to go down to minus two. The coldest I think I've ever seen it here back in the early 80s was like minus 10, minus 15. Okay, well, 
let's hope for another day like that in your future. No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, because you need about uh, anything colder than minus 10 to minus 20 in that range is the perfect temperature zone to make images like this. This is a soap bubble that is in the process of freezing solid. Uh, and so it'll freeze solid over the matter uh, over a time span of about five to ten seconds. Um, so these crystals are actively growing like little snowflakes themselves, uh, and growing to the point where they combine together. And so that uh, that ends up being something really fun and interesting. It um, it's a difficult thing to do because if we go back full circle to the concept of focus stacking, you can't do that here. This is, uh, it, it's so transient that this, from one frame to the next, and my camera will shoot at, you know, 12 or 14 frames per second, from one image to the next, it's already changed dramatically. There's no combining of multiple images here. You just have to get it right and have to get that focus perfect. Um, and that's a challenge. You don't get it right the first time or the second or the fifth. Um, but thankfully, you can just keep blowing more bubbles and keep practicing with, uh, with this particular kind of technique. Uh, the lighting for this is really interesting because it's lit from the background uh, with a flashlight. It's got a continuous light source, but an incredibly high-powered LED flashlight that is blindingly bright. That gives me a shutter speed fast enough to freeze the action of the growth here in uh, in this soap bubble. Yes, but in the okay, what type of soap are we using? Are we using re regular detergent soap? The yeah, just under the dish sink? soap. Or I, I don't know. Uh, I don't mix with water. I guess, would be Twenty the, to one. Soap. Um, and then so you you mix it with a, a specific formula. Uh, so the uh, the recipe is uh, six parts water to two parts dish soap to one part white corn syrup. And the white corn syrup is a necessary ingredient because if you don't add that into the mix, the soap bubbles will pop on impact with the snow. So I'm blowing this through a straw and as soon as that bubble forms at the end of the straw, then a pool at the bottom of the bubble of corn syrup has formed because it's denser than the rest of the material. So when that bubble is placed or it falls onto the snow, that acts like a cushion that prevents it from popping in that very pivotal moment. Some of them still pop, of course, um, but it's that white corn syrup or glycerin can work as a substitute. Um, and uh, so that'll that'll be the ticket to, uh, to making these kinds of images possible. If it's too cold, the bubble will start to freeze before you can get the camera in position. If it's too warm, it'll just take it way too long and it won't look very interesting. Um, if it's uh, too windy as well, we talked uh, in the previous show about wind and macro photography. If it's too windy uh, for this or insects or anything else, in this case, if it's too windy, then the wind will start to blow against that bubble and it will shatter very, very quickly because as it starts to freeze, it becomes even more and more fragile. Uh, and uh, if it doesn't have the opportunity to get to where you want, it'll just fall apart after about a second or two and then you've got to try again. Uh, you can try to build up some wind shields and all of that uh, to uh, to protect it, but in my experience, the best results are always had just when you've got a calm night, uh, and those tend to be the coldest nights as well. Isn't that interesting? You know what, Don? We've once again once again have run out of time. <laughs> I don't know why. We we need a longer show. I can see this coming, especially for you and I. Well, at some point in the future, I'd be happy to come on again and we can talk about, who knows, infrared photography, stereo 3D photography, you well, name it, have me back, we'll chat about it. See, but you're also doing, you are a true photo nut. I can't keep up with you. <laughs> I'm nuts. I like to think of myself as nuts, but you're over the edge crazy doing s these strange and wonderful things that seem to work out for you. You're doing uh, the ultraviolet lights. You're, you're using invisible ink. You're doing 3D photography now. You're experimenting with 3D photography. It, it's like, you're totally nuts, man. <laughs> you're over and, the edge. And more power to me for it, I guess. You know, it, it, the point is that I explore a lot of the unseen areas in photography, which means fewer photographers are doing the same stuff, which makes the adventure all the more worthwhile. Oh, yeah. So, again, we have to go. But if you want to follow Don, doncom, D-O-N-K-O-M dot C-A or dot com, his website. He's also active on Facebook. He's also active for most of us photographers on Google+. Plus. Um, he does have a book out. And I actually have the book uh, for his snowflakes. It's a wonderful book. It explains it all. 
Uh, it really is worthwhile. You can order the book from his website. Uh, once again, Don, thanks for coming on. Uh, as always, it's always awesome to talk to you. I can never get enough of you. Um, I got to thank Shaw once more for being on here. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Two Photo Knots. And maybe we'll have Don back in the following months. Thanks, guys.